Hello and welcome to the All Plane Podcast, always with interesting guests that are busy redefining the future of commercial aviation. As usual, before I introduce today's guest, let me remind you that you can find all the previous episodes of this podcast, as well as many other aviation stories, on the All Plane website. That's allplane.tv, A L L P L A N E dot TV. Now, let's switch to today's episode. If you don't live in Norway, you might not be familiar with an airline called Widro. Uh, excuse me, any Norwegian speakers out there, if I don't pronounce it correctly, because I'm going to be saying this name quite, quite a few times today. Widro is Norway's oldest airline, 90 years and counting, and its core business is connecting the country, linking the many regional airports scattered all over Norway, a country with plenty of mountains, fjords and islands, which often make land transportation impractical along the... I think it's about more than a thousand miles of coastline. Widro has also some international routes, particularly after it got some Embraer E2 jets, but it is essentially a domestic regional airline. But there is an area of activity in which Widro is, let's say, a world leader. And this is what concerns its electrification program. Because rather than sit and wait, Widro has taken a very proactive stance exploring the possibilities of electric aircraft for regional air traffic. And this includes both regional aircraft with conventional takeoff and landing and EV tolls, with the potential to eventually build a multi-layer air mobility system in Norway that would connect even the most remote scattered settlements to the air network, both domestic and international. And more recently, during COP26, Widro announced it is launching a green aviation accelerator called Widro Zero that will channel many of those initiatives and will evaluate new ideas, concepts and projects in the field of sustainable flying. So, in order to get a better understanding of what these guys up north are up to, I've invited Widrow's Chief Strategy Officer, Andreas Colby ax to come into the podcast and talk about Widrow's very interesting and exciting sustainable flight project. So, without further ado, let's connect with Snowy Oslo to welcome Andreas to the podcast. Hello, Andreas. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for inviting me. A pleasure. I guess you are connecting from Norway? That's correct. Oslo, well, the from capital Oslo. of Norway. Yeah. Great. I guess you're having also like a cold snap now? Lots of snow and stuff? Yeah, we got the snow here in Oslo two days ago. A lot of snow. Um, as every year, it comes as a surprise, even to Norwegians. So really? uh, a bit chaotic in the traffic now, but, uh, but, just, but uh, just in time for a perfect Scandinavian Christmas. Yeah. That's true. That's true. <laughs> that, but you know, uh, very often we um, we tend to get the snow and then we lose it again before Christmas. So hopefully it's going to remain and stay till over Christmas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes makes a difference. Um, well, let me introduce you briefly to the audience. Although you're going to tell us a bit more now. So basically, you are leading corporate strategy at Widro. Pardon me if I don't pronounce it correctly. How, how it should be pronounced? Widro? Um, Widro, we say in Norwegian, Widro, but Widro okay. is perfectly fine. Okay, we'll, we'll try it. <laughs> you, you're um, leading corporate strategy at Widro, uh, which is a Norwegian airline that has been possibly one of the most, if not the most active uh, regular airline in the field of uh, sustainability. You are very innovative in, in many ways. And, you know, I think it's going to be great if you can um, today tell us a bit more about all the different projects you're involved in, because uh, there's quite a lot. You have a very advanced project in electric aviation to have electric flights in Norway yes. in, in, a, in a few years. You are partners with Rolls Royce, with Technam, you um, with Embraer as well. You recently announced a project. You all recently spin off, uh, I don't know if that's the right word, but uh, you basically, you created a subsidiary, Widrow Zero, to, um, yes. cha to channel many of these programs and initiatives you have. Yeah. Um, but first of all, like all guests, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself and, and tell us a bit more about your background and, and also about Widrow, because I mean, I know Widrow, I've, I've flown with you guys, I was at a plane delivery, uh, the, your first Embraer E2 jet a few years ago, but possibly many people outside of Norway and outside of Scandinavia might not have heard of Widrow. 
Of course. Um, well, Widra is the oldest airline in Norway. Um, we're approaching 90 years now, so we've been around for a long time. And uh, my uh, time in Widra, though, is, is not that long. I, I joined Widra five and a half years ago. That was uh, ahead of the Ember E2 introduction you, you were mentioning. And um, after I, I joined Vidra, uh, I, I was set to do that project and to convert Vidra from a turboprop airline, uh, mainly focused on regional domestic flights in Norway um, to, to transit into jet operations. And, and with that, allow Vidra to, to fly a bit further out in Europe. So okay. with the um, with the E two introduction, we also started routes to Germany, uh, Finland, uh, the United more routes to the United Kingdom, uh, and and other Scandinavian um, destinations. So we expanded our business at that time, and um, that's uh, well that was back in two thousand and eighteen when you when you were in the first flight, a very exciting time being yeah, launch indeed. customer on on and, the, and on the E two. And a great and a great um, reception gala in in Bergen. Yes, when, uh, we came from from Aberdeen in, Scot in Scotland. That was the last leg of the of the I'm delivery sorry. flight from from Brazil all the way from Brazil to Norway, which it's a, a very yeah. long long journey. But uh, yeah, it was it was amazing amazing experience. Until recently, you were basically very focused on the Norwegian domestic market with relatively small air um, aircraft. Um, flying yeah. short, very short sectors, like places in north of Norway. I mean, it's obvious from the map that uh, air transport is, is essential for many of these communities. It's, uh, it's a, pretty much the only way for people to move around in, in the northern fjords, right? So you, you were fulfilling that role. You are. You are fulfilling. Yeah. No, that's true. I mean, uh, our main fo focus has always been, and it, it's still like that, uh, on connecting the rural parts of Norway. Uh, with the bigger places. And uh, the reason why we have a role to play is because Norway is a mountainous country, also with a lot of fjords, a lot of islands, um, railways and, and highways are very limited in this country and it can take a long time to, to move around without uh, the option of flying. So for that particular reason, we, we are operating a, a, a vast number of small airports around Norway where the mission is to connect the small communities. Uh, very often with quite a few people living in these areas, but it's a, it's a national policy to try to have the, the whole country connected. Mm -hmm. uh, so for that reason, many of the routes we fly are under the so-called PSO regime, Public Service Obligation Regime, uh, where the, where the uh, flight is, is supported by the government financially to be operated. Because it's a public um, service. It's like, it's like a public a, taking service. the bus, basically. Correct. So, uh, and this is because our services are vital to, to uh, connect the country. And it's similar to what you find in Northern Scotland, at the Orkneys, Shetland, yeah. uh, and other also, also places, uh, other places in Europe, like yeah. uh, Greece and France, you have a yeah. few. Islands, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, there are quite a few of these. Yeah, you mentioned this, this uh, kind of activity of, uh, as a public service. And I wanted to ask you uh, whether these let's say that the, the national commitment in Norway, there's, there seems to be a big consensus in moving towards this uh, new green economy uh, in the whole of Scandinavia, I would say. Uh, it's, a, it's a leading region in, in the sustainability goals. I don't know, are you a public company or are you a private? We're a private company. You're a private company. But, but All private. You are, you've been very proactive in, in transforming these uh, green goals into a specific program. Uh, That's to be adopted true. by the industry. And I wanted to ask you about this. First of all, can you tell us about your uh, overall strategy in terms of uh, green aviation? Because as I said earlier, you have different programs. And, and how this fits with the, with the national goals and what's the relation with other actors in the, in the Norwegian green aviation sector? We had in this podcast, we had, for example, the responsible of, uh, at Avinor, which is the Norwegian Airport Authority, and managing most of the airports in the country, which gave us a very uh, great overview of how, how airports are also very active in this. So it seems that there's a very concerted effort by all the aviation players in Norway to, to move in this direction. 
True, true. No, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, um, let's talk a bit first about the, the national ambition of going green. Um, there are, I believe, various reasons and, and many reasons why Norway is very much focused on this. One of them is that we are, together with our friends in Sweden and, and Denmark, uh, as a society, very much focused on the nature and people are are keen to uh, protect everything around them. For instance, the snow today. We want. We were afraid of climate change in general, right? Yeah. So, uh, if if someone was used to living in like this magnificent landscape you have, that would be I, <laughs> no wonder you would be interested in nature. Because exactly. Absolutely, absolutely amazing, to, amazing nature you have there. Yeah, and we want and we want to protect it. And we want to keep it. And and also, it's. I mean, a paradox is that Norway is also an oil, oil producing country. True. We're exporting yeah. a lot of oil and gas, and, and that is one of the main reasons for Norway's economic success. I think on a national level, it's, it's all about now understanding first what this transition and how we can do this in the most sensible way so that we can convert the economy towards more sustainable means of business, because that, that will happen. And by being curious, by being forward-leading, uh, you you put yourself in a position where you can understand first. And, and I think that is important generally uh, to all Norwegian businesses that we want to understand early how we can create new value and make money in the new world of sustainable renewable energy. Uh, so there is a, a national ambition of being successful in the transit from oil and gas to, to, uh, to more sustainable uh, options and, and, and to build also to build business around that. Um, so this comes in addition to the kind of uh, Scandinavian uh, interest in nature and to protect our environments mm -hmm. and all that, all those things. Yeah. So I think that, and this is uh, a a a, um, a goal which is then transferred into. You mentioned Avinor; they have the yeah. same ambition. They want to be ready to help us go this way, and they have some very strong strong goals uh, and ambitious goals and when they set goals um, they tend to be very kind of kind of say motivating in the beginning but if you don't follow them it ends up with taxes Ooh. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so yeah. we understand that okay if the politicians wants to go this way we have to we have to do so uh, as well and 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 also of course from a customer point of view, it's important, we believe, to align with what Scandinavians believes in and what they find find valuable. So also to be a company which reflects their their visions of being more sustainable in their, their ways of living is important mm -hmm. to meet them. Yeah, but it seems that you you've been as a, as a company, Widro, you've you've gone a bit above and beyond uh, even other companies in Scandinavia in this field because we have seen other other airlines, for example, have adopted um, sustainable aviation fuel purchase policies, stuff like that. But um, you, from a very um, early moment, because that's not something that came out this year, but it's already been in the making for, for a number of years already, you've been very vocal in, in taking an active role in, for example, in even designing uh, an aircraft to, to cover, well, designing, I mean, in, in cooperation with partners, but having yeah. taken an active an active role in, in leading this, uh, yeah, even the, yeah, the design of, of, of new tools like the aircraft, the electric air, aircraft and batteries and stuff like that. And um, yeah, uh, how is it that you became, I mean, you decided to take the lead because you, yeah. obviously you're a, you're a large air, air, airline in Norway, but in global context, it, you are not a huge airline. Uh, oh, that's so, true, uh, that's true. <laughs> so that's yeah, that makes it, makes it interesting that, um, yeah. You become yeah. sort of a reference in this in this field. Yeah, and, and, and the reason for that is that we we do believe we have a role to play. Mm -hmm. We have an important role to play because, first of all, the network we operate is probably uh, the best test bed for new technologies. Many of the flights we fly are shorter than three hundred kilometers. Mm -hmm. Actually, on the short take and landing network, which is the, the bus you're you're referring to in the beginning. Uh, those scheduled services to connect the small communities very often it's all about jumping a fjord jumping in and out on an island mm -hmm. uh, very short trips um, 74 percent of them are shorter than 300 kilometers 
which means that we can do very many of our daily services with the technology being available very soon. Yep. So we thought, okay, we have a role to play and we want to, to help the industry convert and transit by being the test bed. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also, and, and uh, it's also an important part of the history that we, we are in a situation now where we operate Dash 8 100s and 200s uh, on these, uh, these smaller airports. And when you are now approaching a technology transition, uh, you would rather try to wait for the new technology to come along than to mm -hmm. invest heavily in existing technology. Yeah. So it's also about fleet strategy. You mentioned earlier, um, this is a, a, a decision we made uh, a few years ago where we were about to, to uh, replace the existing fleet with conventional aircraft. Yeah. But then we realized that, okay, if we do so, the normal process of acquiring an aircraft takes a long time and then you are stuck with the aircraft for a very long time true so if we do this we will be probably operating conventional aircraft until 2040 perhaps uh -huh. yeah because the, the, and, the current fleet is due for replacement this decade right before the end of this decade well well the thing we did because we we figured out okay we, we if we don't want to acquire new old type aircraft it could be uh, the atr 42s for instance mm -hmm. uh, we would need to extend the lifetime of the existing fleet mm -hmm. so in parallel with being very much focused on new technology and try to kind of be the leading edge airline on new technology we decided to life extend the mm -hmm. existing fleet okay so um for instance, we've, we've upped the number of cycles on the Dash 8 in, in collaboration with the OEM from 80 to 120,000 cycles. Uh -huh. uh, Vidra is very cycle intensive, we, we say. Yeah. Uh, we, yeah. we operate very short flights, so our yeah. aircraft are typically outflown on cycles before flight hours. Mm -hmm. So for that reason, we could, we could with some, some modification, up the number of allowed flights uh, allowed cycles from 80 to 120,000 and it may even be possible to extend that even further those are things we're discussing now um, and also by acquiring more Dash 8 100 and 200 aircraft we could reduce the, the utilization on average per aircraft mm -hmm. and now we are in, in, in a place where we can operate the Dash 8 fleet beyond one beyond 2030 Okay. How, how, many aircraft, how many aircraft are we talking about? Uh, we have in total 46 aircraft. That was okay. the last count. Yeah. Those are the Ember E2s and uh, the Dash 8 Q400s used on regional traffic yeah. and also Dash 8 300s, a few of them. Yeah. Uh, but then we have some 25 or 26 Dash 8 100s and 200s. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones we're focused on replacing yeah. by adding a few more aircraft mm -hmm. and up to the number of cycles, we, yeah. we've found a way to bridge, we believe, this technology trans transition. And um, we landed on this strategy instead of mm -hmm. replacing them all in the coming two to three to four years with, with conventional type aircraft. Mm -hmm. So the strategy is to replace this aircraft and in, in practical terms, you have a, a partnership with uh, Rolls-Royce, I think, that has a facility in Norway. Mm -hmm. and an Italian aircraft manufacturer called Technam yep. who uh, kind of developed this electric, uh, it's going to be all electric aircraft, right, mm -hmm. for, for this segment of the market. What can you tell us about this? What's the, what, what are the time frames for this project? What's the status and what, what are the goals you are aiming to achieve? Yeah, no, I mean, we, we started working with Rolls-Royce for now two and a half years ago and the reason why we did so was to we we, we found uh, Rolls Royce being the among the large OEMs the most focused on uh, new novel technologies and for that reason we 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 thought okay we want to work with them to understand what is possible and what is not uh, this was at that time all about understanding first we, I mean we've had an ex extensive work together and that put us in a position to to I believe before most of the, at least the public market knew 
what is what is doable and what is not, right? And in parallel with that, Rolls Royce were working with Technam, and we, we very early realized that this aircraft, even though it cannot solve and do all missions, it's based on technology being available today, and it's realistic to have it in service in the mid twenties. Um, so for that reason, we thought, okay, this is something we want to look more into, and it was a, a uh, an aircraft suggested by by Rolls Royce to us that this mm-hmm. is this is a solution that can work for you, and it may be interesting to 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 do so. Um, it's a battery powered version yeah. of an airframe that already exists in production with Technam, right? So it's an adaptation. Right. Is the the Bolt? I think it's called. Yeah, I it's it's called. a it's a um it's a very new newly certified aircraft, and mm-hmm. my understanding is that they were it was already prepared for this. Uh, there will be some alterations and modifications, of course, to allow for a, a an all electric flight train. This you have to ask Technam and Rolls Royce because I'm, I'm not an engineer myself, so I, I don't want to be back yeah, too much into sure. all the technical details. But but um, but yes, the, the the thing is that this can can be ready for service around 2025, 2026, um, based on technology already in the market that can that is certifiable in this time frame. Mm-hmm. And I think that is a challenge many people underestimate, the challenge of having a yeah. concept taken from the conceptualization phase through prototyping, through certification, and all the way to entry into service. Norway, as a country, has a really ambitious goal, I think, to make all domestic flying electric by 2040. 40, right? yeah. And to start introducing it no later than 2030. That's what exactly. I, yeah, that's a goal. And I guess that that will involve not only Widro, but um, other, other airlines that fly domestically as well. Absolutely. F- FAS, Norwegian. You would think so, yeah. yeah. So that's, that's going to be <laughs> some, some serious investment in, in new aircraft there for the domestic market then. Exactly. Um, yeah. We believe that it's important to start even earlier than that because from the experience we have with being an E2 uh, launch operator, we know what it takes to, to be the first one to operate a new aircraft. Yeah. It's, it's very challenging because there are no recipes on how to do things. You have to work with the OEM, the regulatory body, to have everything in place. And if you don't, you end up with a situation where you have an aircraft being certified, but there is no one to operate the aircraft. Yeah. So we we have then together with with Rolls Royce and Technum said that okay we need to work together and they yeah. understand that they need to work with the operator to have a proficient user a certifiable or approved mm-hmm. user uh, at the time when the aircraft is ready even if it's a very limited operation we also believe that the experience we will build on operating new novel technologies from from mid to late 20s will allow us to 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 be more successful in entering in new bigger aircraft into service in the 2030s yeah. because this is a lot of new technology new capabilities must be built new processes and procedures to an airline yeah. mm-hmm. a lot of new things so you we yeah. shouldn't underestimate the time it takes to learn all this as you said most of your network is is possibly fine in terms of, of distance and all that but they're pretty long pre- pretty long uh, segments in in the domestic uh, norwegian domestic market i mean from oslo to the far north of norway from from the mainland to, to svalbard for example those are flights those are of, well. yeah that, those are flights of, of, of over 500 and even i don't know if you get to a thousand miles but but some of them are quite quite long <laughs> yeah i mean if you if you if you flip norway Norway upside down around the southern part of Norway. Norway will hit Italy. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, so yeah, Norway, yeah. the length of Norway <laughs> is is the um, is the same length as the entire continental Europe. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, you're absolutely right. <laughs> that being said, though, uh, the majority of traffic is around the big cities. Yeah. Yeah. And and um, so it is triangle Oslo, Bergen, uh, Stavanger, uh, uh, yeah, so that's yeah. pretty much most of the traffic, yeah. This aircraft is not only going to be for withdraw, but once it's in the market, it can be used, commercialized all over the world, everywhere. We are just a, a very uh, forward-leaning airline that wants mm-hmm. to be first to understand what it takes to operate these new 
aircraft concepts. Of yeah. course, I mean, we, we're not developing an aircraft for ourselves. We're not taking even part in developing the aircraft. We're okay. just trying to be the very proficient first user of, a, okay. of an aircraft concept. So what's the um, relationship with uh, Rolls-Royce and Technam? You are just uh, have some sort of cooperation agreement, but you are not, uh, there's no consortium or, or joint venture or anything like no. that? We're working closely together uh, and, and do research together. And we started with Rolls-Royce and then it led us to being introduced to Technam and they, they were a, mm -hmm. a natural, has become a natural part in this because they, yeah. they are the airframer to produce the small commuter class size aircraft. But then again, our work with Rolls-Royce extends further. It's, it's about understanding also other concepts. So, yeah. um, but, but we're working very closely. And I think also beyond what we, we talked about regarding the understanding what it takes to operate the aircraft, uh, another role we want to play is to understand first how to build a viable business around this aircraft. Because we, what we've learned through the work we've done so far is that it's going to be very difficult to just put these new aircraft concepts straight into your existing business model. Mm -hmm. Also, the airline must be willing to adapt and to try to find potentially new ways of making the most value out of the new concepts. Mm -hmm. it, I, I, I doubt whether it will be very successful to just squeeze them in, into the existing business model we have today. We need yeah. to be willing to, to, to think afresh and, and also try to see how we can make the most out of new technology. And you recently announced uh, another deal with, in this case, with Embraer's eVTOL branch, which is called Eve. Uh, yep. you, you obviously you already have a, a close relation with Embraer. You were the launch customer for the E2 family of, of uh, jets, as yep. you mentioned earlier. They're successfully operating the, the E2, the E. I think it's the E119 and 195 both. Uh, it's we only did fly the 190, so it's a, okay. a okay. standardized fleet of 190s. Okay, and now you have this uh, this agreement, which I read. I read the, the announcement, but um, there was not much uh, more information beyond that, that that fact that you were cooperating or were planning to cooperate with Embraer Eve. How yeah. does the EV toll technology fit into this all this that we were discussing, the the regional flights and also the other electric aircraft you are involved in? It is in my belief that with the EV tolls being developed, there is some sort of a merge coming now between what is today considered rotary wing operations and fixed wing operations. And with the estimates of the EV tolls capabilities, we believe they can potentially do a good job in Norway, even if they were designed for urban air mobility or over London or Paris or, mm -hmm. or uh, Sao Paulo. Uh, they are probably capable of, capable of doing missions also in the rural areas. Uh, they're more than capable of jumping in and out to an island, crossing a fjord. Yeah. And for that reason, we, we decided that, okay, we, we cannot just consider EV tolls as something we, we, we don't have interest in. We have to actually look more into how they can potentially service our customer in a different but perhaps by the way. It's um, like a multi-layer, um, so you can go then from the very local to the regional stage and, and even to the international with, uh, with the E2s and, and other yeah. aircraft. So you would be able to offer pretty much a door-to-door -door, uh, <laughs> door -door service be, yeah. uh, wherever you want to go in Norway. Yeah, and, and, and this is, I mean, we, we, we want to understand what role the EV tolls will play um, because the EV tolls can do potentially many, many of the missions we do today. And as you said, they can also potentially do other missions, mm -hmm. which may extend our business. Uh, there is a debate in Norway going on, and I think it's the same debate in many countries about whether air transportation should be replaced by road and rail. Um, we want to see a future where uh, people travel more in the air, where air mobility is the, is the way to go. And if we can solve the sustainability struggle uh, or yeah. challenge and also find new and old ways of providing the best service to the customers, we mm -hmm. believe that, okay, air mobility will be the preference because the service we can provide is faster and hopefully also at a cost which is acceptable. Yeah, and powered by hydropower, huh? because in Norway, pretty much all the electricity is produced hydropower. Yeah, not some 99% of all power in Norway 
all electric power in Norway is is uh, fossil free from yeah. waterfalls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we want to want to be open to see if they can play a role, and and with Eve, they also found interest in seeing how these vehicles can be used in a diff maybe a somewhat different application than what most people expect them to do but my view is that they will enter into service sooner in a rural application jumping from one island to another than yeah. from one rooftop to another rooftop in a big city yeah mm -hmm. because of uh, yeah there are many constraints and limitations in a city which you don't have in the more rural areas so we, we want to explore this together with eve how Air mobility can be redefined, I'd yeah. say, in Norway. And, and I guess th there is also all the maritime and offshore applications as well. Which Norway is uh, is another important part of the economy, which I guess I don't know if they have right now. They have enough range for many of these, but but that's definitely something that the rotary wing is doing now in Norway. I mean, when you land in Bergen, you see all these helicopters taking off all the time for the offshore and, and maritime and. and rescue and all these type of things so <laughs> oh you're absolutely right there are many use cases which are interesting to look into yeah, uh, but yeah. I, I cannot tell which one is the most viable one and which mm -hmm. one we want to focus on now but that that's what we want to find out how how, how mm -hmm. evitals may play a role uh, mm -hmm. in the air mobility uh, are there any uh, time frames or milestones right now in this evitol aspect of the business or is at the moment it's very early stage to tell it, it's very very early stage and I mean, it, it, again, it, we are not the company producing the technology, but what we're saying that we will be, if we find this a viable business, we will be the player that is ready to operate the aircraft when the aircraft itself is certified. So again, we want to play the same role, being the test bed yeah. uh, for new technology and being the very proficient partner that can build a certifiable or approvable AOC yeah, and also the company that can work on developing business models, mm -hmm. uh, which fits with these new concepts. And, and the latter part is perhaps the, the well, the main part of our role to play: understand mm -hmm. the business modeling. What about sustainable aviation fuel? Do you have also some policies in place or some goals here? Well, we, we I'd say we are um, supporting all the initiatives going on, but we figure that okay, we in our position have a more important role to play when it comes to new and old technologies. So I, I, very often got, I very often get this question because we're not too vocal about this. We're supporting it, but we also see that there is a challenge in providing enough sustainable aviation fuels. So we believe that that should perhaps be used more on in the areas where it's going to take longer before new technology can allow yeah. for zero emission travels. So for that reason, we leave it to the, to the wide body carriers and those traveling into continental flights True. yeah to, to you, be more yeah. focused on it yeah you have a better a better a better shot at replacing uh the the conventional propulsion with other more in, more disruptive things than other airlines yeah definitely that, that exactly don't have, don't have that that option you were at uh cop 26 a few days ago when you were there you presented something called withdraw zero uh Correct. which I would like you to tell us a bit more about this because I, from what I understand, it's a sort of, let's say, uh, an entity that yes. is going to channel many of these efforts and projects that you have in the field of sustainability. But um, yeah, but my, my knowledge of this initiative uh, pretty much ends there. So, <laughs> so that's one of, the, one of the goals I had in this call is also to ask you about this, Withdraw Zero, and how it works, what is it, and, and what, what goals you guys have. Yeah, uh, I'm very happy to tell about Vidra Zero. Vidra Zero builds on the narrative we've been uh, talking about so far in this conversation, uh, where we see that in addition to understanding how to implement new technology and how to make an AOC uh, certifiable or approvable, uh, we need to understand how to make the best use of new technology, how to build a viable business. And that can be quite challenging in an existing airlines in an existing airline or in, in any existing entity. So for that reason, we figured out, okay, we need to, to carve out and create a separate entity that is free to think afresh. So we call Vidra Zero a air mobility incubator, which is free to look at new air mobility concepts, being Eve's Evitol, the uh -huh. Techno Keywalt, but perhaps also other concepts coming along 
and to be free to think with a focus solely on the technology and what the technology can provide and on the other in the other end what the customer wants mm -hmm. without having to take existing structures or limitations of existing airlines into account they can take think afresh uh, and try to derive the ideal business model based on those two things so the whole idea is to kind of be free to think uh, without uh, all, all the all the legacy of an airline you would say uh, but still, we are so closely connected that we have all the competence we need from it. Mm -hmm. but, are you an investment entity, like a VC, or, or is it more like a, something to have some people inside the company to, to, as you said, think about these things, but, but as part of a, of a broader corporate entity? Are you guys going to be investing in new technologies, new, new startups that might come up with uh, ideas to decarbonize aviation or... Yeah, for now, and I understand the question, for now we're going to first now set up a team uh, and we're, we're going to hire this team in, a, in, a, in the coming months mm -hmm. where we will have a, a, a small dedicated team with one group being focused around the AOC, understanding that, that what it takes. Mm -hmm. uh, one part of the, of, the, of the company will be focused on uh, user experiences, understanding the market. Okay, how will the market react on new technology? It's like you, you don't really know that you want an iPhone before you've seen an iPhone, right? Mm -hmm. So we're trying to kind of understand early how, how do we think we have to sell the new service? Mm -hmm. how, what, what is the customer after and what is the expectations they have to this new service? Mm -hmm. How much are they willing to pay? Yeah. Also, how will the politicians react? What will the taxation level be? All these mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. on the opposite side. And then... Okay try to derive new business models and say that okay uh, this new aircraft concept with these customer expectations and perhaps also these expectations to taxation requires us to operate this this way uh -huh. um, so in the beginning it's all about now trying to understand how the concepts being developed by by numerous uh, OEMs yeah. can become commercially viable um, it's focus on it's focus on the actual, on on the aircraft development, or yeah. or you would be you would be looking at other other pieces of technology that might affect other other parts of the let's say the the, the air travel the ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we will look at the ecosystem. We will understand the whole journey. Mm -hmm. um, so so that will be the focus to to think free of of existing structures and and to see how how we can build viable business around the new concepts being developed. And that is important because if you cannot tell investors how this may become well, uh, a viable business, it's important to have people investing in them. So, yeah. so then, we're, then we have a role to play in, in not only finding how you can operate an aircraft, but also yeah. how you can build viable business and then invest mm -hmm. in these concepts. So we're trying to bridge this. And that is a job we've know that Vidro have huge interest in and uh, Vidro is therefore committed to, mm -hmm. to look into multiple concepts and they've requested and Vidro Zero to do so. Mm -hmm. But we may also work for others in the future. Yeah. Other, when we build confidence around how these concepts can work and become viable business, we're more than happy to work with other partners and airlines and, and perhaps new ventures around that wants to go the same way because we believe this knowledge is needed to understand the business modeling of new aircraft concepts. Yeah. Obviously, the, the um, development of, of new aircraft, new aircraft types, and like, for example, the electrification of, of aircraft, that, that's a very, very eye-catching, very disruptive, and, and, and definitely very important and, and a very formidable challenge. But, but there are also, I mean, I've been following this, this space for quite a while, and there, there's also quite a lot of other, other things that maybe are not so visible, like things like software and and um, operations, optimization of operations, stuff like that. Where there's, yeah, I mean, there, there, there are some, uh, some incubators are now popping up, like trying to uh, nurture these uh, innovations and find ways into the industry somehow. And on that point, I mean, you, you asked whether we would look at different areas, not only the aircraft itself, but the ecosystem around, if I understood you correctly. For sure, yeah, because it could be so that you want to, you want to distribute in a different way. It could be that the future customer want a, 
an app when they they uh, they want they don't i mean we know that the, the 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 younger people don't use websites anymore they're used to apps right they don't know <laughs> they, they don't log into our web page to buy a ticket they just want an app where they can see when the aircraft is coming and when they when there is a service available perhaps you could look into new how new technologies may allow for this different way of optimizing could it be so that you can have a if not fully on demand but a more like semi fixed schedules which are more adaptable to the to the actual needs we will also look into that part of this uh, how how new technology can allow for a, a different business model and that's very interesting so it's not just hardware it's it's uh, other other stuff as well we cannot just focus on the aircraft itself and i also I also want to emphasize that we we're i mean we're very much focused on drive trains and zero emission capabilities but there are also a lot of other interesting things happening with UTM coming now. We want to understand it all. Mm -hmm. um, this comes in parallel, and I think uh, it's it's uh, to be singularly focused on zero emission is not the way to go. You need to see this coming together with more autonomous systems being in place, UTM being developed. Mm -hmm. It's a lot going on in the coming ten to fifteen years, and yeah. and uh, it's in this mix of new technologies we will find a new new way of, of operating airlines in the future. Yeah, no, definitely very, very, very exciting times. You guys have so many initiatives in this field. That I don't know if I'm, I'm missing something here that we haven't covered yet. I think we've covered it all. And I think it's going to be more to tell about when we've gotten Widra Zero up and running. And I'm looking very much forward to that. So it's, um, I hope we can catch up and talk more about this in, in half a year or a year or so. Certainly. In, in the meantime, uh, for people that want to learn more about this, where should they go? Uh, Withrow Zero, I saw that you have a website, uh, although there wasn't much yet in it. At the moment, we're setting up Withrow Zero. So it's yeah. being established right now. And we are uh, we're starting hiring people in the coming two months. Yeah. Um, so it will be a, a some time before it's it's all that easy to find mm -hmm. to find more information online i mean you are really very much ahead of the game now you're 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 the first one to know pretty much apart from what we've already trying to stay ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so you you you, you but it's you getting do, difficult you huh, because there, there's so much going on in this field that it's yeah, yeah, difficult yeah. to to stay ahead um but you're doing but an excellent yeah. job yeah. So it's we we draw, um, but what's the website? I can... mean, yeah, for now, vidro.no, and okay. uh, we will then develop subsites for Vidro Zero uh, and okay. what's going to happen there. But uh, and also, you may follow Vidro Zero on LinkedIn. That's the first place we we've, we've set up a a, yep. a, um, mm -hmm. a company page. So follow Vidro Zero on LinkedIn for now, and there will be more information coming in the in the next months. Perfect. Well. I think that's that's a great moment to to wrap it up here with uh, some leads that we've given to the audience to to follow up withdraw because uh, although it's it's uh, obviously a very Norwegian airline, um, it's got plenty of things to give to the world and to uh, <laughs> and to lead the world in this space. So um, yeah, hopefully yeah, looking forward to see all these all these projects delivering. Uh, their, their, you know, their results, and uh, hopefully they, will, they can be an inspiration for other airlines in, in other parts of the world as well. So, I hope so. Thank you so much, Andreas. Thank you, Michael. We'll keep in touch, and I, uh, I hope we can follow up with the conversation in, in, in some time. Definitely. Thank you very much. Have a nice Take day. Care. Before you go, and if you like this podcast, a quick reminder that it would be absolutely great if you could please give it a rating on Apple, Spotify, or whichever platform you're using or recommend it to a friend or whomever might be interested. Thank you very much and see you soon.